Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, when I was younger, like really younger, I was envious of my classmates who had romantic relationships. My, my parents had forbidden me from having a girlfriend until I was in high school, which wasn't to say I didn't try to be sneaky about it in elementary school and junior high, right? I had a couple of so-called relationships in sixth and seventh grade. Nothing, though, that was able to last uh, after I leave the campus premises each day, right? I was a child of the 70s and the 80s. We didn't have cell phones back then. So if I wanted to talk to one of my friends, I actually had to venture into the main room where we had the one phone in the house that was attached to the wall and dial and talk with everyone else being able to hear everything that I was going to say. So needless to say, no one confused me with being a young Casanova. My first kiss didn't occur until I graduated from eighth grade, and at our graduation dance, I started spending a lot of time slow dancing with the young woman I will call Carrie. Uh, a few days later, we were both at a friend's house for a graduation party that included a hayride where we were able to hold hands for the first time, and then back at the friend's house in the middle of the party, Carrie and I kind of snuck away into the backyard, and there, in the shadows of the moonlight, I had my first kiss. Very, very memorable. Some people remember the first kiss because of the person that they kissed. Others remember it because of the location they were at when they kissed. Still others remember because of a specific time in their life. Me, I remember it because of what I said afterwards. And yes, it was not smooth. Uh, immediately, after I leaned in to kiss Carrie, the first words out of my mouth were, I kid you not, wow, just like a fish. You know, because it was like, and like, I don't know what I was expecting, but it definitely wasn't that. Carrie broke up with me the next day, um, ending my less than one week relationship. All in all, I've only ever kissed four people romantically, and my fourth and last being Jody when we were seniors in high school. Uh, incidentally, she's the only person I ever kissed more than once, so I guess that counts as something important, right? Yeah. Uh, our first kiss, my fourth kiss, was on Valentine's Day, 1986, at a local park before school started. Way better than my first kiss. I kind of figured things out, and Jody was patient with me uh, as we went along. Anyway, welcome to our second week in this May sermon series entitled Love, Sex, and Relationships. And I know not everyone here is currently married, but each of us are in positions of influence with friends, family members, co-workers, neighbors who are married. And if this message doesn't initially seem to offer anything for your personal life, well, maybe you'll hear something that God may want you to share with someone special in your life who is in a long-term relationship. But in all honesty, what I'm talking about today actually goes far beyond just marriage relationships. It, reply, it can apply to many other of your own relationships, so I hope it's something you find helpful. Today's topic is after the honeymoon, and we're going to focus on what it means to actually do love, to express love towards one another, especially our significant others. We live in a culture where romantic love is seen as one of the primary objectives in all of life, right? Whether it's movies, books, or television, marketing and advertising, everywhere we look, we're told that romantic love is where it's at. So I thought we would start today by looking at the issue of falling in love. Psychologists tell us that the impulse to feel love is one of the basic human emotional needs that we have. And, and then... The need to feel loved by our spouse, that is at the heart of all marital desires. But there's a difference between falling in love and staying in love. And I'd like to use the expression, the in love experience, that falling in love, as taken from Dr. Cher Gary Chapman's seminal book, The Five Love Languages. Dr. Chapman writes this. At its peak, the in love experiences is euphoric. 
We are emotionally obsessed with each other. We go to sleep thinking of one another. When we rise, that person is the first thought on our minds. We long to be together. Spending time together is like playing in the anteroom of heaven. When we hold hands, it seems as if our blood flows together. We could kiss forever if we didn't have to go to school or work. Embracing stimulates dreams of marriage and ecstasy. In short, uh, the person who is in love has the illusion that his or her partner is perfect. How many perfect partners do we have in today's service? Only Dathan. He is the only perfect. Oh, we have a couple. Okay. Uh, actually, that, the, uh, that sense of that in love experience is really more uh, fiction than fact in terms of long term. Psychologist Dar Dr. Dorothy Tenov has done long-range studies on that in-love phenomena, that feeling that, that Dr. Chapman just described. And she's concluded that the average lifespan of this feeling in love, this romantic obsession, are you ready? Two years. Two years. Three years if it's a secretive affair. Then it lasts a little bit longer. Uh, but still, that's just two to three years, folks, of feeling totally and completely head over heels in love, which means any relationship that lasts longer than two or three years eventually is going to have to change how you feel about one another. I mean, you're not going to have to change. It's just going to happen. Every couple eventually descends from that head in the clouds in love experience and has to plant their feet firmly on the ground of reality again. And as this wears off and as reality sets in, these couples no longer feel that in love euphoria. And so some couples have gone so far as to say, well, obviously we must have fallen out of love now. And a couple has to then make a choice. They can withdraw, separate, divorce, or sometimes they start in search of a new relationship so they can have that in love experience again. But there's another option. Couples can choose to begin the hard work of learning to love each other without that euphoria of in-love obsession. And that's where love takes on a deeper role in the relationship. And so that's what today's sermon is about. How do we do love? How do we express our love, especially when we're not feeling all lovey-dovey? Because let's be honest, love is a verb. Love is not a feeling. And in reality, as wonderful as it feels at the time to be in love, that in love experience, that really isn't true love. It's not the kind of love that you can build a lifetime relationship on. True love is what unites reason and emotion. It involves the act of will. It requires discipline. It recognizes the need for personal growth that, except for Dathan, many of us aren't perfect and we know we still have to keep working on it and improving. True love is a choice. It's a choice to expend energy on behalf of someone else. And Dr. Chapman argues that true love can't begin until that in love experience has run its course. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? True love can't begin until that two to three years of in love experience runs its course. Now, I highly recommend the book, The Five Love Languages by Dr. Chapman. It's a New York Times bestseller. In fact, I like it so much that whenever I do premarital counseling for a couple, I give them a copy of the book. The book is the result of 30 years of Dr. Chapman's own marriage counseling. It's extremely practical. I, as you read every chapter, you're going to find things that you can take away from it. And the book posits that there are five emotional love languages, five basic ways that people speak and understand, ways that they give and receive love. Seldom do a uh, husband and wife have the same emotional love language. We, we tend to have one primary language that we speak, and then we sometimes get confused when our spouse doesn't understand what we're communicating because we're expressing love the way that we uh, enjoy and know how. But the message isn't going through because they have a different primary love language. And it's almost as if we're speaking foreign languages. Each of us has an emotional love tank that needs to be full for a healthy, long-term committed relationship. Without it, it'd be like trying to run a car without maintaining the proper oil levels. I mean, your car will work for a while, but eventually you're going to burn out the engine if you don't keep replacing the oil. As expensive as a new engine is, though, it's nothing in compared to the effect it has on a marriage. 
if you don't maintain your emotional love tank. Well, whatever the quality of your marriage or long-term relationship is, it can be even better. And when your spouse's emotional love tank is full and, and she feels secure in your love, then the whole world looks bright and your spouse will move out to reach her highest potential in life. But when the love tank is empty and he feels used but not loved, well, then the whole world looks dark and he'll probably never reach his full potential for good in the world and in your relationship. So if you're willing, I invite you to take a look at Dr. Chapman's work together. Some of you have probably read the book and heard this information before, but it's so important. I mentioned that I like sharing this this sermon series about every three or four years because we all can be reminded of just how vital this is. So as you're listening, I invite you not only to be listening for what your love language might be, but also the language of your partner, spouse, significant other, maybe even your children or your grandchildren as you're listening. The first love language is words of affirmation. And the true object of love is not getting what you want, but doing something for the well-being of someone else. And when we receive affirming words, well, then we are far more likely to be motivated to reciprocate with affirming words to others. Now, if this is your spouse's primary love language, then he or she feels most loved when you give uh, verbal compliments, which are always far more greater motivators than nagging words. When you give encouraging words, because all of us have areas that we feel insecure, and most of us have potential we'll never even develop. And what holds us back is courage and self-confidence. And when we encourage one another, our spouse or partner, that can give that all-important catalyst to help us achieve who God has called and created us to be. Kind words. Because as my mom said, how we say something is just as important as what it is that we say. Humble words, because love makes requests. It never makes demands on our partners. And another way to love your spouse in this language is trying to give indirect words of affirmation. That is, saying wonderful and positive things about your spouse when they're not around, right? Speak good things about the person that you're committed to. Say them to your friends, neighbors, and coworkers. And as a side note, word might even get back to you that they were bragging on you. Remember, if this is your spouse's primary love language, then giving them the opposite, giving words that criticize, demean, or tear down, those are especially devastating and hurtful. Many of us recall that childhood rhyme, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. No, no. If, if uh, words of affirmation are your love language, they definitely can have a devastating effect. The second love language is quality time. And if this is your spouse's primary love language, then he or she may be constantly wanting you to do things together, right? Now, it's important to remember that uh, a central aspect of quality time is togetherness, not merely proximity, right? Togetherness has something to do with focused attention, that some husbands and wives think that they're spending time together, but in reality, they're just living together in close proximity, but they don't have their attention focused on one another. So doing something together and giving them our undivided attention is a wonderful way of expressing love. Uh, you can also have quality conversations where two individuals share their experiences, their thoughts, their feelings, their desires in a friendly and uninterrupted context. Most uh, spouses who complain that their partner doesn't talk doesn't literally mean that they don't say a word. It means that they seldom take part in this kind of sympathetic dialogue, uh, as Dr. Chapman puts it, right? And the difference between this and the first love language of, of words of affirmation, words of affirmation focus on what we're saying, but quality conversations focus on what we're hearing from our partners. Sometimes one's personality type makes a big difference in this love language, and Dr. Chapman lifts up two different kinds of people. He says, first, there are the uh, Dead Sea folks. Those are the ones who just like the namesake, uh, receive and receive, uh, but never give back. Uh, but that's okay, right? The Dead Sea has, um, in the Middle East, has no outlet. Everything empties into it. And so Dead Sea people are really good listeners. And they can take and take and take and listen and have a, a tremendous amount of patience and grace for those who are talking. Then you have your babbling brook type of people, right? 
these are the exa exact opposite. They have lots to say, and they aren't afraid to say it. And Dr. Chapman says, sometimes a babbling brook marries a Dead Sea person because when they're dating, it seems like such an attractive match. And then there's also quality activities. Now, here's three simple ground rules. They may seem like a no-brainer, but when you think about it, it's actually really important. Here's ground rules for quality activities. First is that at least one of you wants to do something, whether it's going to the movies, watching sports, playing cards, uh, taking a walk, working on a puzzle, you name it. The second one is willing to do it. Doesn't mean they love it. Doesn't even mean they like it. It means they're willing to do it. Why? Because both of you know why you're doing this, so, so you can spend quality time together. It's a wonderful way to start sacrificing your own desires and interests in order to express love for your spouse by sharing and doing something that you know he or she absolutely loves to do, especially if their love language is quality time. The third love language is the giving and receiving of gifts. Now, a gift is something you can hold in your hand and you can say, oh, he was thinking of me or she knew exactly what I wanted. Now, you literally have to be thinking of someone in order to get a gift to give to them, right? The gift becomes a symbol of that thought. It doesn't matter if it costs money or not. What's important is the evidence that you are thinking about this person. So gifts, then, are visual symbols of love. For the first seven years of our marriage, I didn't get the whole giving flower things, right? Because I'm a saver, and I was thinking flowers, one, they're expensive, two, they're going to be dead in a week. So why put money into that, right? You could use that money for something else. I, I, I really didn't quite understand it. So uh, it wasn't, I didn't get the fact that it wasn't just flowers, but it was that I was thinking of Jody enough to buy something and then bring it to her as a gift. Now, I've grown so much in this area that I actually bought a recyclable flower bag from Trader Joe's that I keep in the back of my car. So every so often I grab it and take it inside and make sure that I fill it up and bring it home for something for Jody. Who said you can't keep teaching old pastor new tricks, right? Now, gifts can be purchased, found, or made. And this is one of the easiest love languages to learn. But to do it well... You may, like me, have to change your attitude towards money. For those of us who are wired to be savers, we are cautious about what we spend. Well, we may need to change that mindset a bit when it comes to the giving of gifts if our spouse has this love language. And again, it doesn't have to be super expensive gifts. In fact, if this is your spouse's primary, primary love language, almost anything that you give will be received as an expression of love. Anything, right? Right? Flowers, handwritten notes, tickets to the movies, a refrigerator magnet, you name it. Anything can be seen as an expression of love. But here's a helpful tip. If your spouse or partner has been critical of the gifts that you've given in the past and nothing has seemed that acceptable and they always take back and exchange what you give, well, congratulations, the giving and receiving gifts is probably not their primary love language. So you can focus in other areas of your relationship. Finally, never underestimate the power of the gift of your physical presence, especially in times of crisis, right? In these instances, your very person, your body becomes a symbol of your love. And when your spouse is going through a difficult time, being there for him or her is critical. And if you remove that symbol, remove your presence, that sense of love starts to evaporate. Fourth, on the primary love language list are acts of service. Now, this is doing things that you know your partner would want you to do, and through your acts of service, you are expressing your love. Again, just about everything you do in this area can be an expression of love if it's done with a positive spirit. Now, why does this count as an act of love? Because as Christians, we look to Jesus as our example, who is always giving himself away in love for others. Near the end of his life, knowing that, that he was, was nearing the end of his life, he took time to wash the feet of his disciples, including the one he knew that would betray him. Because in the kingdom of God, God wants servants. Now, it's important to remember that love must always be freely given. It can cannot be demanded. Now, we can request things from each other, but we should never demand things from our partners. Now, if your spouse has this as his or her primary love language, know that you don't have to do them 
In fact, some of the requests may be things that you really don't enjoy, but if you want to express your love for your spouse, then fulfilling these requests from time to time become tremendously meaningful. And for some of us, we may have to re-examine uh, the stereotypes of roles for gender roles and husband and wife roles, right? And then be willing to do the dishes or cook or vacuum or change the oil in our car, whatever it may be, even if that's not normally our thing, so that it can be a blessing to our partners. Personally, I've come to discover this is my primary love language. This is how I'm wired. I love doing things to help people. Finally, the fifth primary language is physical touch. Babies who are hugged and held and kissed, uh, research has, has said that they develop healthier emotional lives than those who are left for long periods of time without physical contact. In the first century, Hebrew parents uh, living in Palestine not only recognized Jesus as a great teacher, but the Bible says that they often brought their children to him. Why? So that he could touch them. Wise parents in any culture are touching parents. Physical touch can make or break a relationship. It can communicate hate or love or indifference. To the person whose primary love language is physical touch, <clears throat> the message will be far louder than saying the literal words, I love you or I hate you. And we're not only talking about hugs and kisses here, right? A slap on a face is detrimental to any child, but it's devastating to a child whose primary love language is touch. Now, sexual intimacy is just one dialect of the love language of physical touch. Lovingly touching your spouse almost anywhere can be an expression of love, and he or she knows how they perceive uh, best as a loving touch. So don't insist on the ways that you like to be touched. Uh, find out what he or she likes to be touched. And then learn to speak their physical touch love dialect, right? Whether it's running your hands through their hair or giving a back rub or holding hands or embracing, whatever it may be. And your spouse may find some touches uncomfortable or irritating. And, and so if you insist on uh, continuing those, then you're actually communicating the opposite of love. Because again, it's not about you, it's about them. And what is it that they want and need? And of course, in times of crisis, more than anything, we need to feel love. So if your spouse's primary love language is physical touch, then nothing is more important than holding them when they're upset. It's a simple act that can have deep resonance, especially to someone whose primary love language is touch. Now, just another caution, we men tend to think that physical touch is our primary love language because of our strong desire for phys uh, sexual intimacy. But guys, if the other types of loving touches aren't as important to you, like back rubs and walking arm in arm and holding hands, then this may not be our primary love language. Now, I know this has been a lot of information, but I think it's so important and crucial for us in strengthening the health and well-being of our relationship. So before we close, I want to give you some uh, opportunities to discover your own primary love language. Now, the easiest way is to go out and buy the book, The Five Love Languages, because in the very back of the book, they have a detailed uh, inventory that you can take and answer, and it'll be very clear then which your love language might be. You see, in addition to the original book, they also have love language books for children, teens, singles, the military, uh, just to name a few. It's, it's so popular, there's quite a, quite a range of what you can get for you can also go to fivelovelanguages.com and take an online quiz. There's a link in the sermon notes uh, for that website as well. But if you can't do any of those things, you got your uh, brunch plans for your mom and then an afternoon of watching basketball, who knows? We're going to give you a couple things that you can uh, figure out today. So first of all, what does your spouse or partner do or fail to do that hurts you most deeply? So the opposite of what hurts you might be your love language. Or what have you most often requested from your spouse? The things that you ask your spouse for over and over again that uh, may be the way that you feel most loved. Or in what ways do you express love to your spouse? How do you find yourself showing love to them? And so this may be an indication that that's the love language that would make you feel loved as well. And Dr. Chapman says, it's not uncommon for people to, be, uh, to have two of the five love languages that are close 
to equal. In that case, congratulations, you're bilingual in love language, right? And then your spouse, that means your spouse has two different ways that they can express love to you as well. But most important than knowing your own love language is getting to know your spouse, your partner, your children's, uh, your best friend's love language, whatever it is, because uh, then you can ask them on a regular basis, how's your love tank? Are, are you feeling full or empty? What can I do to help fill up your love tank? Because friends, love is a verb. It is not a feeling. And we need to be aware of that difference between the in love experience and the emotional need that we all have to feel love on a regular basis. And if we learn the emotional love language of our spouse, our partners, our significant others, we learn to speak it fluently, then they will continue to feel loved and be able to achieve all that God has given them in their life. And they're able to express love back to us in return. This needs to be a choice that we make every day because love is something we do for someone else it's not something we do for ourselves. The Apostle Paul said it so beautifully when he wrote these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Each of us choose to do love this day and every day, every day as, as we deepen those important relationships that God has given us in this life. Amen.